Greetings and welcome back to 303 in Junior English. We turn to now the Catherine Ann Porter offering, the jilting of Granny Weatherall on page 832, 833. Let's pause for a moment in your notes, though, and just make a quick observation. Because if you've been studying with me now in sequence, especially from about the text, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock on, you've probably identified, and if you haven't, let's identify it now, that there seems to be a shift in the tone of the majority of these titles towards a certain kind of disillusionment or despair. I guess another way to say this is, there's a lot of geographic and literary distance between Longfellow's Psalm of Life, tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream, for the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal, dust thou art to dust returnest. Those opening lines of Psalm of Life, there's a long distance, literary distance, uh, between that kind of text and... Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. That is to say, there's some things that happen in between. Let's list them really quickly. This will be significant for, for example, studying somebody like Porter. When we enter the 20th century, there is tremendous optimism and hope that everything is going to be amazing. Technologies are going to save us. You can find essays written at the very end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, that speak about very soon there will be no more starvation of children. Why? Because we can grow enough food that we can feed everyone. There will be no more illness because we have technologies like penicillin that are going to save us all. The hope and the optimism is unbelievably high. Right? And then... 14 years into the century, the Great War. Then, a few years later, the Depression. Then, a few years later, the Second World War. Then, a few years later, Korea, Korean War. Then, the Vietnam War. So that by the time we're into the 1960s, that's 60 years of the century, the hope that once was so prevalent, in large measure, has now gone away. Let's just follow up really briefly on the conversation we were having about Faulkner's Nobel Prize acceptance speech. What was at the heart of that speech? Two things. Don't be afraid, if especially you're an artist. Don't promulgate fear, but rather promote hope. Now let's say it out loud. Faulkner wouldn't have to say that if everyone was hopeful. Do you get my drift? In other words, the reason he has to say that is lots of people are starting to despair. They're starting to feel worried about the future. They're starting to think, you know what? Maybe technology isn't so great after all. I mean, we were so hopeful about technology saving us, but of course, technologies were the source of tremendous pain and suffering in all of the wars. We now turn to Catherine Ann Porter, and right away we have to say out loud that we're going to have now another text of despair and disillusionment. Some of uh, my juniors over the years have said, can we just take a day off and go back and read a little Walt Whitman, or read a little Longfellow, or a little Emerson or Thoreau, so that we can at least kind of, you know, get happy again, or get hopeful again. It's not a bad idea to every once in a while dip back into those transcendentalists, those romantics, those idealists. Because, of course, we're reading dark material from a dark time. I would write that down. We are reading dark material from a dark time. Struggle to try and find some sense of hope, some sense of equilibrium or balance, some sense of spiritual peace and joy. Let's take a look at Catherine Ann Porter. Take a look at her dates starting on page 833, 1890 to 1980. I mean, think about, look at those dates and just get a sense of how long she lived. But what she saw, I mean, everything I just outlined in regards to the first 60 years of the 20th century, I mean, think about that. She was 10 years old when the century began, right? Which puts her roughly 
14 years old or so, um, uh, she starts to already be into the 20th century by her adolescent years. And then, of course, you can see how old she would be in 1914 when the war began, <coughs> the Great War. Catherine Ann Porter's life spanned, to reiterate what we were just saying. Catherine Ann uh, Porter's life spanned World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the rise of the nuclear age, making her deeply aware of what she called, quote, the heavy threat of world catastrophe, end quote. I would write that phrase down. That phrase has a lot to do with how you read Ann Porter's word. For Porter, her fiction was an, quote, effort to grasp the meaning of those threats, to trace them to their sources, to understand the logic of this majestic and terrible failure of the life of man in the Western world, end quote. Her stories were often set in the South and featured characters at pivotal moments in their lives faced with dramatic change, the constricting bonds of family and the weight of the past. I would write down that last phrase, the weight of the past. A descendant of legendary pioneer Daniel Boone, Porter was born in Indian Creek, Texas. She was raised in poverty and haphazardly educated <coughs> in convent schools. Porter claimed that her true education came by reading five writers. American authors Henry James, T.S. Eliot, and Ezra Pound, Irish writer James Joyce, and Irish poet W.B. Yeats. That's quite a list of some amazing writers. We study, of course, T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound in our American Lit class along with Henry James as, an Amer as American authors. Next year as seniors, you will <coughs> study James Joyce and W.B. Yeats. Beginnings as a writer, the next heading. Porter began writing at an early age, though she did not publish her first book until she was 40 years old. As a young adult, she worked as a journalist. Let's just pause for a second and point this out. Notice the number of people who we've studied who started out their writing career in journalism. Now, of course, today we live in a time when print media is not as popular as it once was. If you, if you read the news at all, my guess is most of you do not read the news through a newspaper, but something online or on your phone or something like that, right? So, for example, maybe you have this little app that pops up the three or four major stories of the day, and it just kind of shows you, uh-oh, there was this thing that happened somewhere in Syria or in London or whatever, right? But for a long time, in most of the 20th century, the only way people got their news was either through print media, newspapers, sometimes magazines, and through radio. Then TV happened, and people started to get their news increasingly through not what they listened, or, uh, listened to, but as much as what they watched, certainly not what they read as much. Her work as a journalist took her to many places, including Mexico City, where she lived for eight years. While in Mexico, Porter developed an interest in writing fiction, and in 1922, she published her first story. Eight years later, she published her first book, Flowering Judas, a collection of short stories which earned her critical praise and widespread recognition. Her next heading, Literary Achievements. Porter went on to produce several other major works, including Noon Wine in 37, Pale Horse, Pale Rider in 39, The Leaning Tower and Other Stories in 44, and of course, Ship of Fools in 1962, her only novel. Although her body of work was relatively small, it consistently received high praise and earned her a place among the finest writers of the 20th century. Her collected stories in 65 was awarded the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Finally, last heading, a first-rate artist. Critic Edmund Wilson once tried to account for the elusive quality that made Porter an absolutely first-rate artist. He said, <coughs> quote, what these stories show us are human relationships in their constantly shifting phases and in the moments of which their existence is made. There is no place for general reflections. You are to live through the experiences as the characters do. Many of my students have found that what Catherine M. Porter is able to do, much like we saw in our study of Faulkner's Rose for Emily, is that the writer can kind of reach out and bring you into the story, and you cannot help but want to be a part of the story and figure out what's going on. Speaking of how that technique happens, let's jump to 2B. Let's get over on page 832. Let's look at the literary analysis information quickly. People's thoughts do not flow in neat patterns. 
We'll go back to some comments that I made in earlier lectures, for example, about the, the influence of Sigmund Freud, as he talked about the psyche as being like a river, like that Bighorn River, where you have all these different parts of the river. You have the surface, but you have what's under the surface. And there's a lot more interesting things in the Bighorn, that disgusting river. There's a lot more interesting things happening under the surface than on the surface, right? Freud said the same thing is true of the, our minds, of our psyche, the way we think. Let's keep reading. People's thoughts do not flow in neat patterns. They move unpredictably among perceptions, memories, ideas. During the early 1900s, some writers began using a literary device called, let's put it in our notes at 2B, stream of consciousness to try to capture the natural flow of thought. These narratives usually did three things. Let's write it down. Stream of consciousness is going to end up on the exam. That's why you want it. One. Stream of consciousness is going to present sequences of thought as if they were coming directly from a character's mind. So write that down. Okay? So we're going to see information directly through the eyes of characters. Two, stream of consciousness will often leave out transitional words and phrases found in ordinary prose. So you're going to jump the same way that a mind might. And finally, number three, stream of consciousness writing is going to connect details only through a character's associations. Stream of conscious narratives, now continuing to read, often include the use of flashback. You want to write that down because it's in bold. Interruptions in which earlier events are described. A flashback, a flashback might take the form of a memory, a story told about a character, a dream or daydream, a switch by the narrator to a time <coughs> in the past. Just to pause here for a 3A observation, you'll remember that when we did Rose for Emily, <coughs> There were those flashbacks to earlier when Emily, for example, had met uh, um, Homer Barron and all of those kinds of things, right? As you read this story called The Jilting of Granny Weatherall, as you read this story, trace the path of Granny Weatherall's thoughts and note the details that trigger her memories and observations. Identify points at which a more traditional story would have provided transitions or other connections that smooth the reader's way. Finally, consider how these structural choices contribute to both the story's meaning and to the sense of artistry it conveys. And by the way, in the reading strategy, clarifying the sequence of events is huge. You might want to think about a graphic organizer like the one that's to your right there on 832 that starts with birth and ends <coughs> with death and then everything in between. Also, let's point out, just for exam prep, that on page 832 you have three vocab words there that you will see on the examination. All right, let's turn now quickly to 835. Let's begin with our background information at the top of 835. Read with me if you would please. Catherine Ann Porter's view of life and the fiction she wrote were shaped by a sense of delusionment. I would write that down. What is delusionment? Well, it's a loss of hope, isn't it? It's a feeling of despair. It's a feeling that things are not going the way they should be going, right? Now, this disillusionment was a result from World War I, the despair of the Great Depression, the World War II horrors of Nazism and nuclear warfare. Sometimes, as in the novel Ship of Fools, Porter focused on political issues such as Nazism. In contrast, works like The Jiltering of Granny Weatherall pinpointed the dissolving families and communities of the modern age. So I would write that down. One of the things that's going to be significant in this story is how the family starts to change. Go away, dissolve is probably not the best way to think about it because we'll always have families as long as we have children, to some degree. But the dynamics of the family and the way that the family hegemony or the unity of the family starts to kind of break apart. Okay, we have professional reader again for us reading this story. Let's go ahead and pay close attention. Let's just scan the story really quickly as we, t as we flip through the pages just so that we can see how long the story is. This is good for us as readers. I'm going to recommend often, for example, with ACT prep that you do the exact same thing. When you pick up a section of the ACT, no matter what it is, Flip through it real quickly. Get a sense of the lay of the land. How much time are we having to give to a story like this? And you'll see that we finish over on page 843. Unlike other stories, we don't have any kind of identifiable breaks. Did you notice this? Like we don't have any kind of part one, part two, part three, like we've seen in other stories, all right? However, we may pause at different points in the story to make some observations. All right, here we go. Let's get ready to read now together. The Jilting of Granny 
Wetherall, all right? The Jilting of Granny Wetherall by Catherine Ann Porter. She flicked her wrist neatly out of Dr. Harry's pudgy, careful fingers and pulled the sheet up to her chin. The brat ought to be in knee breeches, doctoring around the country with spectacles on his nose. Get along now, take your school books and go. There's nothing wrong with me. Dr. Harry spread a warm paw like a cushion on her forehead where the forked green vein danced and made her eyelids twitch. Now, now, be a good girl and we'll have you up in no time. That's no way to speak to a woman nearly 80 years old just because she's down. I'd have you respect your elders, young man. Well, Missy, excuse me. Dr. Harry patted her cheek. But I've got to warn you, haven't I? You're a marvel, but you must be careful or you're going to be good and sorry. Don't tell me what I'm going to be. I'm on my feet now, morally speaking. It's Cornelia. I had to go to bed to get rid of her. Her bones felt loose and floated <coughs> around in her skin. And Dr. Harry floated like a balloon around the foot of the bed. Let's pause for a second and just point out a couple of things at level one. Notice the genius of the way this story opens, right? So, for example, right away, we had this, she flicked her wrist neatly out of Dr. Harry's pudgy, careful fingers and pulled the sheet up to her chin. And then the next line, the brat ought to be in knee breeches. And immediately we realized that's what the old lady is thinking about the young doctor. So let's put it in our notes right away at 2A. We're already introducing, aren't we, one of the major seeming themes that reoccur over and over in a lot of these stories, youth versus old age. You've got a young doctor, you have an older patient, this will be Granny, and her relationship to him is, don't tell me what to do. You're young, you don't know what you're doing. I'm old, I've lived a long time, right? Okay, so we've got that kind of tension already developing in our story, right? Don't tell me what I'm going to be, she will say, right? Back and forth. But let's continue now as we get along now with characterization and the development of characterization. He floated and pulled down his waistcoat and swung his glasses on a cord. Well, Stay where you are. It certainly can't hurt you. Get along and doctor you're sick, said Granny Wetherall. Leave a well woman alone. I'll call for you when I want you. Where were you 40 years ago when I pulled through milk leg and double pneumonia? You weren't even born. Don't let Cornelia lead you on, she shouted, because Dr. Harry appeared to float up to the ceiling and out. I pay my own bills, and I don't throw my money away on nonsense. She meant to wave goodbye, but it was too much trouble. Her eyes closed of themselves. It was like a dark curtain drawn around the bed. The pillow rose and floated under her, pleasant as a hammock in a light wind. She listened to the leaves rustling outside the window. No. Somebody was swishing newspapers. No. Cornelia and Dr. Harry were whispering together. She leaped broad awake, thinking they whispered in her ear. She was never like this. Never like this. Well, what can we expect? Yes, 80 years old. Well, and what if she was? She still had ears. It was like Cornelia to whisper around doors. She always kept things secret in such a public way. She was always being tactful and kind. Cornelia was dutiful. That was the trouble with her. Dutiful and good. So good and dutiful, said Granny, that I'd like to spank her. She saw herself spanking Cornelia and making a fine job of it. What did you say, Mother? Granny felt her face tying up in hard knots. 
Can't a body think, I'd like to know. I thought you might want something. I do. I want a lot of things. First off, go away and don't whisper. She lay and drowsed, hoping in her sleep that the children would keep out and let her rest a minute. It had been a long day. Not that she was tired. It was always pleasant to snatch a minute now and then. There was always so much to be done. Let me see. Tomorrow. Tomorrow was far away and there was nothing to trouble about. Things were finished somehow when the time came. Thank God there was always a little margin over for peace. Then a person could spread out the plan of life and tuck in the edges orderly. It was good to have everything clean and folded away, with the hairbrushes and tonic bottles sitting straight on the white embroidered linen. The day started without fuss, and the pantry shelves laid out with rows of jelly glasses and brown jugs and white stone china jars with blue whirl gigs and words painted on them, coffee, tea, sugar, ginger, cinnamon, allspice, and the bronze clock with the lion on top, nicely dusted off. The dust that lion could collect in 24 hours. The box in the attic with all those letters tied up. Well, she'd have to go through that tomorrow. All those letters, George's letters and John's letters, and her letters to them both, lying around for the children to find afterward made her uneasy. Yes, that would be tomorrow's business. No use to let them know how silly she had been once. It's an interesting, let's pause for a moment, it's an interesting way to get into a story. We've got an old woman lying in a bed with a doctor attending to her, and of course this Cordelia person that we will come to realize is her relation, right, who is obviously worried about her. I've often said to